Thank you for joining us today. I'm Paul Marshall. I'm a partner and the lead within our corporate crime and investigations practice. Delighted to welcome you all to the latest in our release cyber crime, cyber events uh, sessions. Um, my team advises on cyber compliance and response to cyber incidents. With me, I've got a great uh, panel of Craig Potter and Martin Stone today. Um, a bit about Craig. First, he is a detective sergeant with Police Scotland's Cyber Crime Investigations Unit. He's a wealth of experience and specialist crime, particularly in complex investigations involving economic and cyber crime. And uh, my partner and colleague, Martin Sloan. Martin's a partner in the commercial services team at Brodie's, specialising in data protection and cyber risk. And he advises clients on cyber readiness and planning and as part of the cyber instant response team. So um, welcome to you both today. Thanks for being on the session. Um, Craig, let's start with you. Can you tell us a bit about your background in the police and how you arrived into the cyber crime operations team? Uh, yeah, thank you, Paul. So um, I've been in police for 14 years. Um, I joined, as everyone does, as a, a, a frontline police officer doing emergency response. Um, and due to my previous experience, uh, an, an opportunity came up to apply to get into economic crime and fraud inquiries. Um, so 2012, I, I applied, uh, became a detective in economic crime. I did nearly six years in economic crime. and. Uh, during that time, I was starting to get into some much more technical inquiries, a lot of telecoms work, a lot of technical data in the way um, frauds were being committed, and an opportunity came up to start doing a degree in cybersecurity, uh, sponsored through the police, um, which I started in, uh, in, in, in 2017. Um, and shortly after that time, I got an opportunity to move over to cybercrime, where I've kind of been for the last four years and, and, and got promoted within cybercrime as well. Great. So it almost sounds as though the, the work you were doing previously almost started to move you in the direction of, of cyber because you needed to have those skills um, to face up to the type of criminality you were seeing. Yeah, yeah, totally. So um, the, the way frauds are committed um, has gone from personal contact to very much online contact um, and um, the, the methods of investigation have had to move that way as well. So if you're, if you're in a unit and the, the, the way crime's committed is changing, you have to adapt as well. Yeah. And that's how I kind of fell into it almost. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, my decision, I'm going to go in this direction. It was kind of, that's the direction that, that the criminality is going and the opportunities ar arose at the right time for me. Um, I never set out to become a cybercrime investigator. I wasn't particularly good at computers at school, um, but it's it's something I've had to learn and, and, and a direction I've kind of fallen into. Great, great. So t tell us a bit more about what, what does the team do? What type of work does the cybercrime operations team do? So um, we are effectively responsible for all high, investigating all the high level cyber attacks that impact Scotland. Um, and we work quite closely as part of what's called Team Cyber UK. Um, we work with uh, the National Crime Agency, the regional organised crime units across England, Wales, Northern Ireland, um, and uh, also the National Cyber Security Centre. So our, our individual unit, we've got a whole of Scotland remit. Uh, something happens up in Orkney or Shetland, uh, it's still going to be us that's investigating it. Um, and uh, there's at the moment there's 12 officers for the whole of Scotland, based between Edinburgh and Glasgow, uh, but we are in the, in the initial steps of getting a, a, a team based in the north, north of Scotland as well to deal with those geographic issues. Great, great. So give, give us some examples then of what are the, the common cybercrime uh, situations you see? So our biggest impacting, biggest tariff crime is ransomware, um, where a company comes in one morning, they can't get into the computer systems. There's maybe a readme file left on the computer systems, which says we've encrypted all your data. Uh, it might also say they've stolen a load of data at the same time. Uh, you need to make contact with us um, in order to pay a ransom to get your data decrypted or so that we don't release your data on the dark web. That's kind of the highest 
post hitting tariff one we deal with. Uh, we deal with a lot of network intrusions, data thefts, um, some complex frauds, some data protection offences, um, and, and some insider threats as well. Uh, we've had a couple recently where employees of companies have um, either facilitated access to the network for criminal groups or have themselves stolen quite substantial data and then look to profit from, from the sale of that data as well. Right, right. Really, really interesting spread. And that first example of the ransomware was where I was going to start today because we all think about ransomware when we think about cyber events and cyber attacks. So let's let's draw into that for a minute. So I'm imagining the event happens, you know, um, the organization's locked out of its systems, you've got that communication from the perpetrators. I like the, the sort of read me file, but that idea of we hold the keys to your system. I'm going to do something unless you do the following. Now, I'm going to come back to you on that in a minute, Craig, to get, get the sort of police take on that. But Martin, bringing you in at this stage and thinking about your role advising organizations, when they receive that bombshell, if, if you can receive a bombshell, um, what, what, do, what do they think at that moment? What should they be doing um, in that, that first hour, that first day when they get that communication? Thanks, Paul. Yeah, so I mean, the first thing is step before that, which is ensuring that you've got some form of instant response plan in place and you know who's going to deal with it and you've tested it because what you don't want to be doing is going into an incident like that, never having actually done it before, prepared for it because you're just going to panic um, and also make sure that whatever your plan is, you can access it from off your network um, and you get a way of actually communicating with other individuals. I mean, you hear uh, stories about people who just can't actually access their instant response plan because it's on the network that's been taken down or they, they're not able to contact everyone so there's some preliminary steps to think about. In, in terms of how you approach I mean, you, you said you know, what, what you do in the first hours and the, the first day so if, if you think about your instant response plan as being kind of in four, state, four stages the first one is about analyzing what's happened then you go on to contain and mitigate it uh, then you're looking to remediate it and eradicate what, whatever's happened. And then fourthly, you're looking at recovery. So in those first couple of hours, you know, the, the first thing you want to be doing is some form of technical containment. So you, know, you obviously detect that something's happened. What are the immediate steps you can take to try and contain or mitigate that? How do you stop it prevent uh, spreading and perhaps infecting other systems or other parts of your business um, or organization? How, how can you mitigate that? Um, and also think about things around preservation of evidence as well. Um, it won't be the first thing on your mind, but it is quite an important thing to do to make sure you don't do anything that actually uh, causes you to lose a whole load of evidence. Um, you'll then want to get your instant response team together um, and then implement the, the plan that you've hopefully got, got ready to go. And then that's all going about, you know, thinking about who you tell within the organisation about what's happened. Um, you want to instruct external lawyers and um, you might think we're just doing that to plug our services, but that's quite important because in terms of maintaining privilege um, for you know, reports and things like created, if you do that through your um, solicitors, then you can uh, ensure that, for example, a cyber forensic report um, potentially gets privilege and therefore is, is protected and not going to be subject to disclosure. So um, that's quite important early stage in making sure that's done through there. And then it's about you know, risk assessing what's actually happened, what, what, what's the impact, what's the cause, um, what's the impact both on your business but also your customers the third parties that you you deal with so can you carry on is it a sort of you know it's absolutely killed the business and you can't you can't manufacture you can't trade whatever it may be um, is there a major data breach and then thinking about you know okay how, how do we recover from that and, and a good instant response plan and good training will have gone through a couple of different scenarios so that you know right this is ransomware this is how we deal with it or this is a data breach this is how we how we deal with it and then you'll also want to think about who you need to tell about this um, and notify. So, for example, uh, contacting law enforcement um, and other people, I'm sure we're going to talk a bit more detail around uh, who, you, who you need to tell when you've suffered a, a cyber incident. Yeah, we'll do, we'll do that. And that's a, a really great dump of the whole show there, almost, Martin, for us, which is helpful. Um, go, go back, though, one, one step. So I, I get very clear at that point that you don't want the the real event to be the first time that you're considering the issues here. And so obviously you want to have your, your team and your, your processes already agreed in advance. How, how do you, 
it's, it's easy to have I suppose, the, 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 the team with roles and responsibilities already allocated. And it's also, you can have a, a plan of, of what you will do, but how do you go about the mechanics of actually running a, a, if like a dummy test of, of your systems or, or your response? What do you do there? So the, the really good, um, so Craig mentioned the National Cybersecurity Centre, the NCSE and an organisation like Scottish Business Resilience Centre have got really good exercises in a box that you can access and download right. and you can run them so they will give you a scenario to work through and you'll get different amounts of information so say this is what's happened, you then go into the next stage and then say right okay you're now being told this and it takes you through that scenario, you know, working through it over a couple of hours and they are fantastic learning exercises, you know people really you know, get tested in that environment and then you learn loads in terms of how you then can deal with it better the next time. Great. So we, what we'll do is we'll make sure after today's event that we're making some links to those resources available for everybody who's uh, who's joined or is interested. But so, um, okay, we've had this or what's the business doing in those early moments? What's the first response looking like? It'll be doing what it needs to do. Two questions for you, Craig. One is, when should the organization get in touch with your team? Yeah. Uh, and two, in practice, how often do you get that early call or how soon do you get that type of early call? Um, we would always advise getting in touch with us at the earliest opportunity. Um, at, at least you have to have an understanding of what you're facing. So you, you have to have called out your internal IT. They have to have, what, what is it we're dealing with here? Is it just um, a, a corrupt machine or is it a criminal attack? If it's clearly a criminal attack, we would want to be at least phoned as soon as possible. I think the, the worry from a lot of companies is that they're going to have uh, police cars with sirens come in and uniform officers turning up at their offices, which is just, it, it, it's just not the reality. The majority of our early response um, is done over the phone and via email. Um, it might be a week, it might be two weeks before we turn up at a company and it, it, it's generally to suit them and when, when it suits the company, but the advice and the network that we can tap into immediately, if you're facing a ransomware attack and it declares in the ransomware attack, this is the Conte ransomware group, we can tap into a whole network, um, the Team Cyber UK and, and international intelligence about how that group operate, um, what they've done in the past. Oh, there was an attack three weeks ago. This is exactly how they did it. These are some identifiers of compromise that, that your team might want to look for, or this effectively we can provide that advice. And we can also give you coaching in what you should be thinking of in terms of incident response. Do you want to appoint a private incident response company? Do you, if you're a smaller company, do you want to pull in a solicitors? Have you got cyber insurance? Um, we can, we deal, we respond to these incidents all the time. We can, we can sort of guide you through what you should be thinking of. Um, some of the larger companies, they, they're, they're on top of the ball. They do all that themselves. Um, in reality, um, we very rarely get called on day one, sometimes day two or three, um, uh, sometimes a week or two weeks down the line and um, on a lot of occasions we don't get called at all. We might pick up on it um, when a company's data is released on the dark web, um, yep. maybe two weeks, a month down the line. Yep. And uh, that happens on a regular occasion or we might get intelligence through that a particular company has been hit by a cyber attack through various mechanisms and, and we then we will look to engage the company do you want to engage with us? Do you want to cooperate with law enforcement? Can you feed that law enforcement beast with any information you have and, and, and we'll kind of go from there? All right. That, so one bit I'm interested in just to explore more, that, the idea you very really get that call on the first day. Yeah. When, and I, I also get that there's going to be people who don't contact you at all, yeah. but for that category in the middle who call you maybe the second day or a week later, so you have a chance at that point, won't you, to say, why did you not get in touch earlier? What was your thinking there? Do you get a do you get the sense of why organisations are reluctant to reach out to the police? So, a, a lot don't think of cybercrime as traditional crime. A lot don't think the police investigate cybercrime, um, and some 
have had bad experiences with the police um, in, in terms of trying to report minor cybercrime incidents and, and being, being told it's, it's not a crime. Um, there's, the, there is just that societal thing that it's online, it's faceless, it's if you were subject to a crime and an assault in the street, everyone expects you to go and report that. Yeah. But if your company, which is not an individual, is subject of a crime, which can be a lot more serious, a lot more impactive, uh, some people don't see that as crime. They, yeah. they see it as that's just what happens. And um, and, and there's other companies that um, they they just don't, they, they don't think it can be investigated. They, so what's the point? We're just going to waste our time dealing with the police um, to, to get nowhere. So so what is the point in us wasting our time uh, having to dedicate resources to, to, to reporting and dealing with the police? Yeah. Um, and others are pushed to report it by their insurance company as a, as a legal obligation uh, in order to get their insurance or pushed to report it by the Information Commissioner's Office. Um, we have no legislation that can force you to report. Yeah. What the Information Commissioner's Office can can dictate that you must report to police. Um, they very rarely do that, but um, it is it is one of the things that they can that they can place on on companies. Yeah, and, and you, you're a bit around. You've got that experience or that wider perspective because Police Scotland will have seen a, a range of cyber attacks happening. So you 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 and you've gotten those connections with other law enforcement. So you've got that broader. Yeah. Um, perspective and awareness yeah. to, to help with presumably the strategy or the tactics or how the how the company should or the organization whatever it is should respond or how best to respond yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah we we totally and the, the, there's there's a bit of what the company needs and, and martin kind of went through if you're sitting as a company lead you, you're thinking about mitigation recovery you, you're thinking about all these things we sort of come at it at a different angle. We think on a societal level. Yeah, you, you've you been the victim of this crime. Um, has any of your data that's been taken got any impact elsewhere? Are you a supplier to critical national infrastructure? Do you supply the police, the NHS, nuclear power stations? Um, that's the kind of thing that's going through our minds, which isn't necessarily going through the company's mind at the time. and. And the, 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 there's times where we'll, we'll really push a company because there is a wider risk to certain industries and a wider risk to the UK yeah. of, of certain things. Yeah, so so one of the things I was interested in was that idea about objectives and the Police Scotland objectives compared to the company's objectives yeah. here. And you're, I think you're quite openly saying that they won't necessarily align, it won't necessarily be the same, yeah. the same goals across the board for you and for the organisation. Yeah. So um, on, on the, the top level, so recovery of that company, recovery and ongoing operation of that company is generally the top priority. Um, I'm only aware of one instance um, where a ransomware has resulted in a death and been treated as a homicide investigation. Um, and, and, and that took a total, total different avenue. But on the whole, recovery of your company is the highest priority for you and we will treat that as the highest priority. Okay, okay. If that results in loss of evidence, um, and, and I'll give you a good example of that. So volatile memory is one of our best sources of evidence um, and that is lost as soon as you unplug a device or a server. It's, it's the, the, the living memory of the device. Um, if it's a choice between leaving a device on but suffering more impact on your network because the attackers are still in there or unplugging the device um, and potentially losing that evidence, we'll, we'll tell you to unplug that device all day long. You should be making that decision anyway because it's all about uh, minimizing the risk and, and, and mitigating the threat at that point. Um, if we can leave the devices on, that's where we kind of come in. And if we get informed at an early stage, we can have an open and frank discussion can you leave that device on? Uh, have you got some control over your network? Can you block incoming and outgoing traffic to such an extent that we can then come in or you can get an incident response company in and we can get a RAM capture of that device because that is generally where we're going to get our best evidence because that tells you what has just occurred on that device. 
Um, and, and, and as I say, it's volatile. As soon as you unplug, it's a kind of living memory and it's, it's kind of lost. Um, that, for me, that's really interesting, that, that piece of uh, the flexibility or, or the, let's say the, yeah, we'll go flex, the flexibility of your team in that situation where the, the best way for you to identify evidence, which is going to give you the, the best prospect of catching the, the villains, so to speak, yeah. you, you may be willing to compromise or be flexible on that if, if another option is going to actually protect the business's interests or the organization's interests in the short term. Yeah, it's it's kind of um, if we if we like leave that device on and there's a risk to that company, there's a risk to their employees, there's a risk to their customers, we're looking at a major community impact in, in if we're focusing on Scotland in Scotland. And if it, at the extreme end there's a potential that that company might go under, then we'll we'll forego any evidence all day long in in the interests of preservation of that company, people's jobs, the customers, the local community, we'll we'll forego that all day long and and we'll make no bones about that. We'll we'll happily make and policy that decision. Um, and we've lost evidence because of that. And that that goes up to if you're dealing with a traditional crime, preservation of life comes first. Sure. Yeah. So you you will forego evidence if it can preserve someone's life. We will forego evidence if it can preserve a company running. It's it's exactly the same same sort of. So yeah, really, really helpful way to think about it. That I think that'll help the or the audience as well. That that analysis. Now, that's the the police perspective on on that collaboration, Martin. I'm interested in your experience in dealing with organisations who've faced or been the victims of a, a cyber attack. Do you think, or is your experience that that organisations have the same perspective here that it's possible to work in collaboration with the police? That there there can be that shared uh, way forward with with so common objectives, or or is your experience more towards the beginning of what Craig was saying there that there'll be a, sen- a reluctance or a concern to to get law enforcement involved? Yeah, I mean, I think I think certainly historically there has been a reluctance to to do that, or not not so much a reluctance, but more it's just not top of the priority, because as say it it is all about containment and recovery and keeping that that organisation going, um, and I suppose maybe sometimes involving law enforcement might be seen as a distraction to the primary goal, which is to stop that or to get the business back up and running, you know, get your DR systems in place or whatever. Um, not necessarily actually finding out who's behind it. Um, so I, I think you know, sessions like this are really helpful to actually, you know, I suppose, get across how law enforcement approaches this, because I think there is sometimes a misunderstanding or a, a concern if you involve them, you'll be, um, you know, going down, being taken down the wrong path or not doing the things that you think are the are the priorities. Um, but actually the reality is, is, isn't like that there, you know, as Craig says that, uh, if it's choice between preserving evidence that might help to uh, pursue someone versus causing further damage to that organization or their their employees or customers then the the latter is it's got to be the right way to go yeah and i'm going to something we might get on to in a few moments but i'm drawn into a little bit now which is that point that craig's already flagged of the perspective or the experience of the police in terms of seeing a range of cyber attacks i'm interested in the idea and Martin, probably for you in the first instance, the idea that getting the getting law enforcement involved at an early earlier stage or an early stage can actually help the strategy that the organisation adopts here. What's your does that feel like something, an opportunity that organisations should be using? Is that something that you that you think is a realistic way to look at things? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So both, both with um, you know involving the police, but also the National Cybersecurity Centre, which uh, Craig, Craig has mentioned before, and um, which has sort of UK oversight for understanding threats and a cyber incidents. You know, you may actually find that the cyber incident you're facing there's actually ten, a hundred other organisations at the same time. Um, we've seen that you know with Petra and things like that a few years ago, where loads of organisations have had that. So it's much better actually to know that you're not in this alone. And actually, that how you are tackling that is done in a coordinated way, and also that you're getting information um, about how they're dealing with it, or how how it's impacting on it. Because if you just carry on in a silo, 
you're not going to know actually that actually there's, there's something you could do which might might help your position or you can share some knowledge yeah. so uh, yeah it, it kind of depends i think on the nature of the incident sometimes they are just one-off attacks on a particular organization but sometimes they will be more um you know strategic in terms of hitting lots of organizations or exploiting the same vulnerability um in a an application or system great great so now thinking about good and bad and Craig, coming back to you, so from your time dealing and responding to cyber attacks, I'm very much interested in good examples of, of working with the organization. So what's, what's worked well? Where have you seen that good collaboration that means that everyone wins to, to an extent? And that's the good side. And I also want you to tell us, if you can, about some um, more negative experiences or less positive experiences where you've found that, for whatever reason, that working hasn't produced the goals that you'd like to see yeah um the the good experiences so we we respond to companies large and small we've seen companies large and small recover from ransomware attacks that have affected their entire networks they've 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 got to a full recovery in the week um and they've got to that full recovery because they've had the right backup policy the right recovery policy they've had incident response teams who are well ex exercised um, and they've got business continuity planning in place um, and it's literally a case of right day one or two you're suffering major impact but we've got full backups they're off site and you know what we've exercised recovering from backup we've exercised this this critical scenario and yes it, it might take a day or two to reinstall from backup but within a week they're fully operational We've also seen companies, large and small, have the exact opposite. They have the backups connected to the network, which are then encrypted, or they're getting um, uh, backed up to the cloud, but each day it overwrites. And by the time they get to the backup in the cloud, it's overwritten yesterday's, which was a good backup and, and, and things like that. Um, so the, the, the best kind of company response we've seen is, is that, um, and they call us in early, they get a proper understanding. We get, they, 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 they pull in all the, the partners, solicitors, insurance, and, and they make a full recovery really quickly um, and, and perfect response, exactly what's needed. They've still got the impact of if they've lost data, if data has been exfiltrated, and, and, and that's something that can be dealt with separately. But as an entity, they keep trading uh, and, and they're back to full capacity really quickly. Um, there's, the couple of um, couple of poor ones, um, I've, I've probably not used one of my own personal ones. I'll use a, a very publicly knowledgeable one, which was the Talk Talk hack from a few years ago. Um, they were actually hacked. Um, I think it was in the, the the June or the July, and lost about thirty thousand customers' data. Someone got into the system. It was flagged up to their IT. They didn't have a proper incident response. Someone swept it under the carpet. They did no investigation, didn't mitigate the threat, didn't declare publicly. Um, and then some of those customers started to get hit with fraudulent phone calls. Um, and then in the September, they got hit again in exactly the same way, but much, much bigger. I think there was something like 14 million customers data, data went. They still didn't put in a proper incident response initially. And it, it took kind of a month down the line before they were basically being pestered externally before they publicly declared, yes, we have been hit by a cyber attack and this is what we're doing to respond. And they had a PR disaster on that. They, their response was, was appalling and they're still suffering the effects of, of customers not trusting them to this day. Um, I, I've, I've got elderly family members who have read the newspaper articles and would, would never go with Talk Talk again. Because of because of the way they reacted to that incident, um, and it, and it shows you the impact in in a poor, that a poor response to a cyber incident can have on a company um, that they're, they're still impacted to this day in their customer numbers. Yeah, the, the reputational impact of that being managed in the wrong way takes a long, long time to recover from, doesn't it? Really. So, I, I want I do want to go laser in for a moment on the 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 sticky question about ransom. Yeah. Um, and again, the scenario here, uh, and Martin, thinking about this from your perspective, the police are pursuing their lines of inquiry. 
Meanwhile, the organisation feels that it's got this ticking time bomb in front of it, threat to pay up or else. Um, what, what is the attitude there that you've seen in, in organisations? Um, what are they thinking in terms of how they bring closure? Um, what's the best way forward? Do they, are they thinking, let's, let's, pay, let's pay up and move on? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it depends uh, on, on a number of factors. Craig's touched on some of these already. I mean, first of all, what, what has actually happened? Um, what is the impact on your business and what business continuity or backups have you got available? You know, are they, are they working or are they not? Um, are you in a position where you, you're not able to recover? Clearly, if you can recover, you don't need to pay the, the ransom and you can get your, your data back. Um, but as to what you actually do, you know, that will be influenced by your insurer. And we, we ran a session um, before Christmas with um, uh, Vanessa Cathy at Lockton, the, the insurance brokers, where she was talking about cyber insurance. And, you know, she was saying that from the, the insurer's perspective, they, they, they do sometimes, uh, yeah, they accept that people will, will pay ransomware. But also the, there's an interesting business bit to this here because the, certainly her view, and I've heard contrary views from others, but the, the well-known gangs, operate this as a business so they they charge their their ransom you pay it up you get your data back if they didn't if you paid your your ransom and you didn't get your data back they'd be out of business in terms of actually running that as a business so there, there is kind of she referred to this being a code of conduct amongst um criminal gangs which is a slightly bizarre concept but One amongst thieves yeah yeah so you know they, they've got to actually do this to, to do that so you, know, you you do get a bit of certainty if you're dealing with a well-known gang i guess that you will get your data back but on the other hand actually decrypting the data and getting your systems back up and running will take take time it's not a quick process so it's much better to not be in there in the first place some organizations take stand and they won't make payments um you know i think sepa is the, the big example of that with their their um instant at the end of uh, 20, 2020 and um, where they decided they weren't going to pay that and you know they, they are still recovering from that and they're very open about that I've spoken about it but other businesses um don't have pay you know, don't have that luxury in terms of deciding not to do that and just trying to recover you know if, if that impacts your ability to trade it's uh you know potentially existential so i mean ultimately i think you know, it comes down to who you're dealing with what's actually happened what what contingency plans are in place are they are they workable can you recover and then speaking with you know speaking with the police speaking with the ncsc your insurers your forensic investigators to understand what you're facing and you know whether you think actually you will get your data back if you if you pay that sum yeah and on that point about speaking with the police so craig you've got the organization maybe the investigation has been going on for a, a while their 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 instant response and your investigations been going on for a few days yeah. they're, they're getting more and more um concerned the discussion around paying ransom is coming more and more to the fore what what do you say to organizations do they talk to you about that and what what's the police's attitude to paying a ransom so our we, we do get engaged in those conversations our attitude is always do not pay the ransom however if you are going to engage in paying the ransom um we we want to know about that and we, we almost want to be involved in that we we can provide certain levels of support um, which which I can't go into, uh, unfortunately. But we there are a number of evidential opportunities for us as an investigation team around that. Um, but ultimately, for me, it, it comes down to an ethical dilemma, and um, the decisions that are made, the decisions that are generally made by a CEO of a company, based solely on the impact on them and that company. They're not made in the interests of wider society. They're not made big picture ethical decisions um, because if nobody paid the ransom, these groups wouldn't exist. It's, it's an entirely financial model. Um, so by paying the ransom, you're effectively funding, funding the, the, the criminality and you, you'll never be held to account in the UK, but some countries are looking at outlawing payments to ransomware groups. Um, and and, and, and like considering that as a almost an act, a criminal act by the by the organisation itself. Yes, yes. So looking at it effectively money laundering, if you uh, you're you're funding a criminal group, yeah. um, it's it's certainly not in the UK, and it's not something that's been looked at in the UK. Um, but the, the, there's other countries looking at legislation like that. 
Yeah. Um, and, and on the same vein, I know Canada have implemented legislation that will force companies to cooperate with law enforcement uh, in, in, in cyber attacks. Um, we're nowhere near that in the UK, but um, it shows you kind of if, if, if industry doesn't self-regulate, then, then governments might take action to, to impose certain certain things on them. Yeah, no, absolutely makes sense. And that, that's a really interesting um, area to watch in the future to see if, if we move to having legislation that controls what the organization can do yeah. in those circumstances. The, the bit that I wanted to, consciously we have about 10 minutes or so left of our time, and I do want to get on to some audience questions which have came through, but um, just coming to the end of our, our piece, tell us, Craig, have you got some positive stories of you mentioned earlier the faceless it's a faceless crime when that's the thinking on it have you got some positive stories about the bad guys being pursued and caught um yeah so i three investigations in the past two years we've been involved in where we've either caught members of ransomware groups or impacted on them not me myself in the uk um, we work closely across UK and international law enforcement, um, and we've been involved in a number of operations with Europol, where we've engaged in joint operations that have resulted in um, uh, identifying and arresting members of ransomware groups. Um, the Sudden Akibi or Evil ransomware group, uh, there was some uh, executive action taken um, last year, um, and that that resulted in the recovery of the, the master decryption key of, um, of all the ransomware. So we were able to effectively go back to all our victims in Scotland that had been victims of those ransomwares and ask them, have you managed to recover? Have you still got your encrypted data? Here's the, the, the master decryption key. You can effectively go back and, 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 and decrypt your data. Um, and uh, we, we, we we got to the same sort of level with the Lockagoga group. We've taken out the, the, the whole money laundering side of that operation, um, all the money men, but we, we haven't managed to get after, after those that are actually perpetrating the cyber crime, because as, as Martin sort of alluded to, the, these are organized crime groups. There's, there's a real division of labor within some of the, the, the groups, and it, it's totally separate. The money laundering side, the communication side, the, the, the kind of the, the, the technical side of the groups. Um, and there, is, there are some jurisdictions we just can't reach. Um, the Conti group, um, well known to operate out of Russia, but where we can't reach the individuals, um, even if we've got them identified, we can take some disruption action, uh, disrupting their infrastructure, disrupting the servers they're using. Um, and, and we've been involved in some disruption work against the Conti group um, and the, the Emotet uh, infrastructure that has been used by a lot of ransomware groups. Um, we, we were involved in the, the, the kind of takedown of that infrastructure as well. Great. So what we've got is a, quite a few of the questions coming through are around the ransom and ransomware um, challenge, I suppose. The common question that's come through from a few of the audience members is when you have a situation where the, the, the ransomware attackers are, are instructing or directing the organization, do not instruct the police or do not engage the police here. If you do that, something bad will happen. Um, so for both of you, I think, start, starting maybe start with you, uh, Martin, on that one. In that situation where the, the cyber um, criminals are saying, don't get law enforcement involved, where do you go with that, with the client in that situation, given all, given all the, the positive um, aspects and contributions that Craig's team can make? I, I, I'll maybe hand over to Craig, because I think we could get um, the, the police's view on this, but I, I think you know, one of the challenges you may already have actually done that and got them involved already. Um, ultimately, I think it comes down to you know, a conversation with, you know, again, to understand who you're dealing with, how credible that threat is. Um, and also then you're speaking with your insurers. Clearly, you're going to have to speak to your insurers about it. So you can't not do that. Um, and taking you know, some a steer from them. Um, but it's yeah, it's it's quite a it's not it's not a nice message to get um, yeah. in terms of how you actually how you actually deal with it. Um, I don't know, Craig, if you to yeah, yeah. So 
ultimately it's a threat. It's it's exactly the same way that a in-person kidnappers would work. They would make a threat on the person they're communicating to try and extort a ransom. Uh, don't don't involve the police or I'll do something, do something bad um, to, to whoever I've kidnapped. What I would say is that those threats are made generally at a time when your entire network's been encrypted and your data's already gone. What else are they going to do to you? They, are we going to do something bad? What else are they going to do to you that, that impacts on your organization? And you, you may be able to think of something, but they've already got your data and they've already encrypted your network. So where are they going to go from there? Um, and we have seen, we, there's been a couple of occasions in the UK where they've left that initial ransom message on the, on, on the company system. They've had no communication. So they've gone on to link, LinkedIn. They've identified the senior members of the company and they've either emailed them or phoned them directly. We've had a couple in the UK where they phoned them. Um, fortunately, it's in pidgin English, um, made threats down the phone, but you can make that assessment once you engage in communications that, right, this isn't someone based in the UK, this is someone based overseas. There's no real physical threat here. Maybe they've, they've, they've got another technical uh, threat on my system, but my system's already goosed. So you can, you can kind of minimize or mitigate the threat that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a few more questions on the, on the same point. So I apologize, I'm not going to be able to cover all of those um, today, but we will certainly come back. If, if anyone wants to get in touch with more specific questions around the ransomware piece and paying ransoms. I'm going to, to, to jump back, Martin, to a question that came in for you a little bit earlier. And it's, it was in response to, to you referring to legal privilege here. And the, you were, I think, quite gently saying, this isn't a plug for lawyers, but um, and you were saying the value of lawyers in that situation is um, legal privilege. So in what way does legal privilege apply here to help the organization? So the, the mainly what I'm talking about here is when you're engaging your uh, forensic um, investigators who are going to actually look at your system and work out what's happening, do a root cause analysis in there to say, right, what what happened? Uh, how did how did the, the attacker get in? And um, what have they done? Potentially, where are the vulnerabilities in there? Now, all that information is potentially quite damaging if it gets, um, you know, if you had to disclose that to someone who might have a claim against you. And I'm thinking particularly here around, um, you know, a personal data breach um, in terms of, you know, the, someone bringing a claim for, for damages. We, we all know there's lots of attempts at class actions and things like that on the back of some high profile claims. So is it the advantage of instructing that forensic report through um, your solicitors is then that it will get the benefit of uh, legal privilege which then means that um, it can't be disclosed in the way that a report commissioned directly might be um, capable of being ordered to be disclosed and as part of the, the disclosure process with that, that claim um, and that there, there, may, there may be depending on the nature of the report it might fall within um, litigation privilege but you don't really want to have any um you know ambiguity over that or find actually because of the way you'd instructed it or the nature of the report it wasn't actually about litigation um you know it doesn't fall within that and there's something prepared by a non-lawyer um it doesn't automatically fall within um legal Protection. legal privilege whereas going through your lawyers you get the benefit of that got it okay good now craig final word for you i think as we come up to the end of our time here you've talked about in the outset the range of uh, cyber crime you're seeing at the moment, this discussion has really moved to become dominated by the ransomware uh, attack space. It, in the next five years or so, where do we see um, cyber crime going? Is that is the ransomware approach still going to be the, the mainstream or are there other things coming down the tracks that we don't know about yet? Um, the, the, the ransomware, so We've seen it professionalise over the last, from sort of when it first appeared nearly 10 years ago to five years ago to, to now significant organised group, crime groups with Division of Labour. And we've seen them change their tactics in line with how we investigate, how companies respond. Um, more recently, there's, there's a group come to the fore this year that have decided, well, we're, we're encrypting, we're encrypting, um, uh, networks, but we're not getting the ransoms paid. 
the, the biggest threat to the companies is actually the data. So we're just going to steal the data. We're not going to bother encrypting the network anymore. And we're going to hold you to ransom because if you don't pay us, we're going to expose all this data in a way that that causes you the biggest impact. So it's just going to evolve depending on what the companies do, depending on what law enforcement does. Uh, it's effectively an arms race. As soon as we innovate and develop, the criminal actors have to innovate and develop as well. And it, 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 it's constant. So it will change. It will keep going. Something new might come to the fore, but ransomware is kind of the last 10 years, it's gone from being virtually non-existent to being the biggest impact across across the sector. Um, and I don't see it changing anytime soon because it's so, so profitable for, for these groups. Some of them getting multi-million pound ransoms paid. Um, so it's it's well worth their while. Right. Well, that, that, is that a positive note to finish on? I'll try and make it a positive note by saying it's great that we, there's the specialist team in Police Scotland who are tooled up. Um, to, to track these people down and to do these investigations. And as, as Martin, as you've been saying, really important to have the right expert advice, whether that's lawyers or others on your, your side as well. So leaving that as our sort of positive uh, message at the end of the session, I'm going to say thanks for the fantastic discussion, both from Craig and Martin, really enjoyed hearing what you had to say. Thanks to um, the audience um, for sending questions into us. I'm really sorry we didn't have time to cover everything I've run over a couple of minutes already, um, but really uh, glad to see all the input from everyone um, today. Um, we will keep you updated on developments as we go. Of course, if you want to hear more from us or you're interested in what we're saying, please get in touch. And after this session, you will receive a survey um, asking you to give some feedback. Please do uh, respond to that. We really appreciate all your feedbacks and comments. So that's all from us. Thanks. Bye bye.